Hi students, this video lecture will walk you through chapter three and some of the requirements of what we need to know to understand the demand for labor. So remember, demand for labor comes from businesses. Businesses demand workers in order to make their products or sell their services. Individuals, however, supply that labor. Right? So it's different than what we've been talked about and we'll, we'll hit this point again multiple times throughout the semester. Businesses demand labor, individuals supply labor. One interesting aspect of the demand for labor is that labor is a derived demand. That means that the demand for labor comes from, or is derived from, demand for the product. So we heard in the Wetzel Pretzel Two Malls with a Minimum Wage uh, story from NPR was that whenever the minimum wage went up, the owner of the pretzel shop said, how many pretzels do I need to sell to cover this? Right? Businesses don't say, oh, I want so much labor. Instead, they say, I want to sell blank. How much labor do I need? So let's stop and watch this clip from Moneyball and see if we can figure out what's the problem. The goal that every market, every business faces is trying to answer the question, what's the problem? We'll talk about this uh, once we come back from this short clip. We're trying to solve a problem here, Billy. Not like this, you're not. You're not even looking at the problem. Well, we're very aware of the problem. I mean, okay, good. What's the problem? Look, Billy, we all understand what the problem is. We have to okay, replace- Okay, good. What's the problem? The problem is we have to replace three key players in our nope. lineup. What's the problem? Same as it's ever been. We've got to replace these guys with what we have existing. No, what's the problem, Barry? We need 38 home runs, 120 RBIs, and 47 doubles to replace. The problem we're trying to solve is that there are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap, and then there's us. It's an unfair game. And now we've been gutted with the organ donors for the rich. Boston's taking our kidneys, Yankees are taking our heart, and you guys are sitting around talking the same old good body nonsense, like we're selling jeans, like we're looking for Fabio. Think differently. We are the last dog at the bowl. You see what happens to the runt of the litter? He dies. Billy, that's a very touching story and everything, but I think we're all very much aware of what we're facing here. You have a lot of experience and wisdom in this room. now. You need to have a little bit of faith and let us do the job of replacing Giambi. Is there another first baseman like Giambi? No, not really. No. Not and if there was, could we afford him? No. No. Then what the fuck are you talking about, man? If we try to play like the Yankees in here, we will lose to the Yankees out there. Boy, that sounds like fortune cookie wisdom to me, Billy. No, that's just logic. Who's Fabio? Shortstop. So this scene from Moneyball illustrates a great thing when it comes to labor demand. The scouts uh, that Billy Bean was dealing with um, were really focused on the labor. They were focused on how do we replace our labor? How do we replace Giambi? How do we replace the home runs? How do we replace uh, the outfield and the catcher and the first? How do we replace these players? But the real problem, which Billy Bean noticed, was that what they really wanted as an organization was to sell wins. Right? Our goal is to sell wins. And then we need the labor. The scouts were focused on, well, let's replace all of these players. But instead, they should have been focused on, how do we sell more games? So demand for labor is based primarily on two aspects. Marginal product, which is how much a player produces or how much an individual produces, and marginal revenue the value of the product that that person produces. So in the case of baseball, the marginal product would be how many wins does this person help us, help our team achieve? And then the marginal revenue is how much are those wins worth? There's a second clip from Moneyball, which we'll watch now, which demonstrates um, Peter Brand and Billy Bean going through the process of identifying how many games do we need to win? And then therefore working backwards, how many runs do we need? and how many runs should we allow? So let's move on to that clip now. It's 
So using this equation on the upper left right here, I'm projecting that we need to win at least 99 games in order to make it to the postseason. We need to score at least 814 runs in order to win those games and allow no more than 645 runs. Okay, so that's a great clip that shows organizations thinking about the product that they're producing and then considering the amount of revenue that can be generated uh, behind the scenes and then figuring out what do we need in order to get there, right? How many wins do we need first? Then how many runs do we need? How many runs can we allow? Then let's pick the labor that follows that. So again, demand depends on two things, how productive someone is and the price of the product that they're producing. So the goal of the firm is to increase profits. Recall that we talked about rationality and that uh, firms are profit driven. So the cost of inputs and prices of goods are determined in the market. We're gonna focus on perfect competition and we'll move in later to other markets uh, where that isn't necessarily the case. But for the sake of just starting with, uh, with the demand for labor, let's assume that the cost of inputs and the prices of those goods are the same and that they're determined by the market. So the market determines how much I have to pay my players and how much I get to sell my games for. Also, part of that profit maximization is that the firms get to decide whether and how much to increase or decrease production. While this may not actually be true for baseball, we can look at other markets where they actually decide how many sandwiches do we sell today? How many bats do we sell? How many baseballs do we sell? We get to determine whether we sell at all and how much we get to sell. This is known as making decisions at the margin. The idea is, I, as I produce, I decide, do I want to produce another one? Do I want to produce another one? Do I want to produce another one? This isn't an either or type decision. It's not a I produce or I don't produce. All right, that's started off, and then it turns into how many I choose to produce. Firms don't make big decisions every day. They don't determine capital, they don't determine buildings, uh, they make those once and then not again for a while. But daily, they determine how much do I produce today? How much do I produce tomorrow? How much do I produce after that? Our goal when it comes to figuring out how much to produce, so the optimal output level, is to try to figure out if the additional income from another unit is higher than the additional cost. If that's the case, we want to produce more. If I can sell one more product, and I can make more money than it costs me to make that product, I want to produce more. If I produce another unit and the revenue that I generate is actually lower than the cost, so it's costing me to produce that item, I want to reduce production. I'm producing way too much. If the income from the additional unit is equal to the cost of that unit, I don't want to make any changes. I'm at a good point. The amount of money I'm generating in terms of revenue is offsetting the amount of cost that I'm generating from producing that item. So our short-run production function is going to show the relationship between inputs and outputs. We're focused on the production of something, right? so in this case maybe wins. We care about the production and we're going to use two inputs, labor and capital. This is labor economics, so we're going to focus entirely on labor, but later on we'll look at how capital plays a part. And we're gonna have similar results when we talk about capital. We're gonna start with the short run, which assumes that one of the inputs is fixed, and because, again, because this is labor economics, we're gonna hold capital fixed and look at how labor changes, or I'm sorry, look at how the production of outputs changes whenever we change labor. So we can uh, write the production function for a firm as simply total product is equal to a function of labor holding capital fixed. So you'll notice this graph that it has that curve at the top and it decreases. Primarily that's because of what's known as diminishing returns. So total product is the total amount of output produced by quantity and a fixed amount of labor. Marginal product is looking at how much additional product is created when we add one additional unit of labor. The law of diminishing returns states that as we add an additional unit of a variable, in this case labor, to a fixed resource, capital, the marginal product of labor will eventually decline. We can only hire so many workers, in this case maybe so many baseball players, before we just can't win enough games. As we add more and more labor or more and more stars, more and more talent to our team, we will win more games. 
However, as we add so much talent, that's going to start to diminish. It's not going to have the same impact as it did before. We can calculate marginal product of labor as the change in total product divided by the change in labor. So we'll use the Greek sign delta to represent the change. So marginal product of labor is the change in total product, so the additional product, divided by the change in labor, the additional amount of labor. Let's take a look at how we actually graph uh, marginal product of labor. So we'll work through the table first, and then we'll go on to graph. So again, remember the marginal product of labor is the change in total product associated with one additional unit of labor. So using this table from the slides, let's look at what happens as we increase our number of workers from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Our total product will be the total number of wins that this team produces. I'm setting the marginal or the total product of wins to a relatively low value um, just to keep the numbers relatively simple and not necessarily in line with baseball. We'll then go through and calculate the marginal product, which is the change in total product when adding another worker. Notice that as we go from 0 to 1 workers, our total product increases from 0 to 8, which means that as we added that worker, they added an additional 8 units or eight wins to our team. Moving from one worker to two workers, notice the total product increases from eight to 20, which means that the second worker added an additional 12 wins to the team. Going from two to three workers, the third worker added a five more wins. The fourth worker added an additional win, and the fifth worker actually cost us a win. They actually decreased the number of wins that we had. This is where the diminishing returns is going to start setting in and going negative. We can look at this graphically taking the same total product that we had in the previous table and graphing it and showing that the same curve exists where we increase quickly in the beginning, begin to diminish, which is where diminishing total product sets in, and then begin to decrease. And so I'll highlight diminishing total products in just a second. If we look at marginal products, you'll notice that it's increasing in the beginning, so we have an increasing marginal product, and then it begins to decrease, it begins to go negative. Right? Not negative in terms of losing values, but the slope becomes negative. That means that the, the rate of change has now started to decrease. We can graphically show this uh, using these two graphs. You'll notice in the beginning of the total product graph, a very steep increase in the beginning and then a not so steep increase later on. That's where diminishing total product begins to occur. We go negative or decreasing total product in that right corner that's actually cost us a win. When we look at a marginal product graph, the diminishing marginal product occurs when the slope of the curve or the slope of the graph becomes negative. Let's now look at the case on trying to calculate the short run demand for labor when both the product and the labor markets are competitive. That means that the firm is producing a, in a perfectly competitive market. Now while baseball might not be the best example for this, something in the agricultural markets, maybe corn or milk, would be a better example of a perfectly competitive good. The idea is that the firm is a price taker. No matter what their production function, they receive the same price for their product, each product that they make. We're also going to assume that the labor markets are competitive, which means that the inputs that we are using are identical. Again, perhaps baseball is not the best example of identical inputs. However, we can consider baseball in terms of talent, where each player possesses a unit of talent, and the talent units are identical. Some players just have more talent than others. But again, to make it simpler, let's use an example of perhaps a farmer or a field worker who has similar skills and are easily substitutable. In this situation where labor markets are competitive, we're going to assume that the wage is, a, is given and that the firm can't control the wage. So again, a perfectly competitive firm is a price taker. That means they cannot set their own price, they must sell at the market price, and they must hire at a market wage. Again, we'll look later as we change some of these assumptions, but we're going to start with the foundation and then build from there. 
Companies want to hire workers as long as the additional revenue, which we'll call marginal revenue, is more than the additional cost, the marginal cost. Right? So the marginal revenue for a firm is the change in total revenue over the change in quantity. And that depends on the demand for the good. Again, we're going to focus on a perfect competition, which means that the marginal revenue is equal to the price. For every additional product, Q, that I produce, I will receive some price, P. So in the very simplest case, marginal revenue is equal to P. We have a horizontal or a flat marginal revenue and demand curve. Marginal cost, on the other hand, is equal to the change in total cost over the change in quantity. Normally, this depends on the cost of producing outputs. For labor inputs, we're going to focus on labor. So the labor inputs, we're going to use wage as the cost. Again, they're, they're using the market wage, so the marginal cost of each worker is equal to the wage. We can actually go on and use an example of trying to figure out exactly how many people a firm should hire based on that same production system of setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. One nice thing about labor economics and demand is that we now can introduce what's known as a marginal revenue product. So we've already learned about marginal revenue, we've learned about marginal cost, and we've learned about marginal product. We're going to look at the marginal revenue product, which is something a little different. The marginal revenue product is equal to the marginal revenue times the marginal product. If we use, if we, we can convert that to where the marginal revenue is the change in total revenue over the change in quantity, while the marginal product is the change in quantity over labor. Multiplying those two fractions together, we can eliminate the change in quantities that cancel each other out. A marginal revenue product is just the change in total revenue over the change in labor. How much revenue does an additional unit of labor produce? That's our goal in determining the optimal output or the optimal input level of workers. The marginal expense of labor, which we could also call marginal cost or the marginal wage cost, is the change in total wage expenses when hiring one more worker. We're going to use the wage rate to make that simple. So the profit maximization rule is we want to hire workers as long as the revenue that they're producing, their marginal revenue product, is greater than or equal to the marginal expense. We need our baseball players to produce enough revenue to equal the cost that they have for the team. Similarly, we could write it as the marginal revenue product is equal to the marginal wage costs. So let's move to a table and actually use an example of a perfectly competitive toy manufacturer. Toys are a little easier because they are, most likely, more perfectly competitive than a baseball team. We're going to assume that the toy manufacturer can sell their stuffed bears for $5 each. We're also going to assume that the market wage for workers is $25 an hour. So again, remember, we're looking at a perfectly competitive goods market, so the teddy bears all sell for $5, and we're looking at a perfectly competitive labor market, which means each worker is going to earn $25 an hour regardless of their skills. We're assuming that all of these workers are identical. So you could be given a table like this on an exam and asked to calculate and fill in all of the spots that are blank, just knowing the amount of labor and the amount of quantity that that labor, labor produces and the information in our example, we can compute the entire table. Let's start with the easiest pieces. So instead of working left to right, which we could, let's fill in exactly what we know. I always recommend this as a tool for taking an exam because you're guaranteed to get some points if you can fill in the obvious. Well, the first thing we know is that the price of teddy bears never changes because it's a perfectly competitive market. So regardless of the number of bears that we sell, the price is always going to be $5 per bear. So we can fill in $5 in that column. We can also calculate the total revenue, which is easy to calculate because it's the price times the quantity. The total amount of money we generate is the total number of bears we sell, Q, multiplied by how much we can sell those bears for. So you'll notice that 10, if we sell 10 bears, we earn $50 in revenue, whereas if we sell 33 bears, we'll earn $165 in revenue. Those are probably the two easiest to calculate. We can calculate marginal product, which is simply just the change in product from adding an additional worker. 
So going from zero to one workers, we go from zero teddy bears to 10 teddy bears. So that worker produces 10 bears. Going from one to two workers, the second worker produces an additional nine bears from 10 to 19. And we can fill in that column all the way down where the fifth worker is, earning, or is producing four additional bears. Now that we've calculated marginal product, we can calculate marginal revenue product, which is marginal revenue times marginal product. Our marginal revenue in this case is equal to the price because it's a perfectly competitive market. So what we want to do is multiply the price times the marginal product. And that will help us calculate the column for marginal revenue product. The marginal wage cost is the additional wage from hiring one additional worker. We're going to assume that the workers make $25 an hour and that the labor represents the number of hours used to produce bears. So for each hour, we're going to pay $25 per hour. Again, this is similar to price and it's quick to fill out. It's $25 for every hour. Total costs are easy to calculate as well. It's the marginal wage cost, which is the wage we're paying our workers, times the amount of hours that they're working. So if they work one hour, we pay $25, two hours we pay $50, three hours we pay $75, and so on. Finally, profits is the difference between the amount of money we generate, our total revenue, and the amount of cost that we incur, our total cost. So subtracting total revenue and total, sub, sorry, subtracting total cost from total revenue, we find that after one hour of work, or hiring one worker, we generate $25 of profit. Two workers generate 45, three workers generate 60, and so on. Notice that four workers is actually the largest amount of profit, and it took us filling in this entire table to come to that conclusion. We can actually do that a little simpler. So the company should hire four workers, where it's equal to $65 of profit. We know that the firm should keep hiring as long as the marginal revenue product is greater than the marginal wage cost. The marginal wage cost in this case is equal to the wage because they're price takers. Our hiring rule says that firms should hire workers as long as the marginal revenue product is equal to the wage. So for each position where the marginal revenue product is higher than the marginal wage cost, we want to continue to hire workers. However, we've gone too far when we hire five workers because the marginal cost of the fifth worker is $25 but they're only generating $20 worth of revenue. We can simply or even quickly come to the answer by finding the point where marginal revenue product is greater than or equal to marginal wage cost, but not less than. We can use this to generate a short run demand curve. A firm will only add additional workers if the worker adds more to revenues than to cost. The marginal revenue for a curve is a firm's short run demand curve. It's going to slope downward because the product of labor diminishes as more of it is used with a fixed capital. When we use just a little bit of labor, we're very productive, but as we add more labor, our production decreases. Multiply that by a constant price, and our marginal revenue product curve looks just like the marginal product curve. There are some objections to the marginal product theory of demand. One such objection is that managers can't actually calculate marginal revenue product. It's too complicated for them to measure. If this was really the case, we'd expect competition would weed out the bad producers. The ones who are really good about calculating marginal revenue product or coming very close to it would continue to be successful and maximize their profit, whereas the ones that truly couldn't calculate it would be eliminated. The second objection is that you can't measure the output of individual workers. However, you can divide labor easily to measure productivity, which is exactly what they do in Moneyball. They talk about dividing players and dividing a team into at-bats and trying to find the workers who are most productive at getting on base and producing wins. So while these objections to marginal product theory of demand uh, seem based in actuality, they're truthfully not. While it's, not, while it's definitely true that Managers can't accurately predict marginal revenue product, and you can't completely measure the output of individual workers. It's not necessarily true that they're completely ignorant to marginal revenue product or ignorant to the amount of output. We're probably somewhere in between, leaning closer to being able to perfectly predict marginal revenue product, even if we're not exactly there. This will end our introduction to the short run 
labor demand curve. On Monday, we'll pick up where we left off and we'll start looking at how capital plays into the equation whenever we start controlling for capital and how firms substitute between capital and labor. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm sure you'll be seeing more of these throughout the semester. Thanks.